The topic of this section is the ubiquitous p-value, encountered in virtually every clinical research article and publication. Let's once again return to the process of data analysis slide from the introductory module to provide context for our discussion. Our focus here is on making inferences about the population under study, the two primary inferential statistical tools used for making inferences are p-values and confidence intervals. We assume that we have a random sample of data and are interested in using both confidence intervals and p-values to answer questions about the population under study. What are the questions being addressed by each of these approaches? The confidence interval addresses the question, how precisely do we know the population parameter? As we have discussed, this approach provides an interval of values that we believe brackets the true population value with a specified level of confidence. The p-value addresses a subtly different question. How sure are we what the population parameter is? Implicit in this question is an assumption about the population value that we will discuss in a moment. Let's look a little closer at the steps involved in each approach. For the calculation of a confidence interval, we start with the sample estimate of the population parameter, for example, the sample mean or sample proportion. We then calculate a 95% confidence interval for the population parameter of interest. We know that we can be 95% sure that the range of values includes the true population value. We then interpret the values in this interval in the context of relevant statistical issues, clinical knowledge, and prior literature. In particular, we focus on the width of the interval and the clinical importance of the values contained in that interval. For the p-value, we start by making an assumption about the value of the population parameter. Next, we calculate the difference between the sample estimate of that population parameter and the hypothesized population value. We then calculate a probability to determine how rarely a discrepancy this large or one larger could occur due solely to random sampling variability. The smaller this probability is, the more evidence we have that the hypothesized population value is actually incorrect. We then interpret the size of this probability, the p-value, in the context of relevant statistical issues, clinical knowledge, and prior literature in the same manner as done with a confidence interval. Critical to the understanding and calculation of the p-value is the notion of the hypothesized population value formerly known as the null hypothesis. Specification of the null hypothesis involves assuming a specific fixed value for the population parameter of interest. Then, under the assumption of the null hypothesis, a probability is calculated that answers the following question. What is the chance that in a random sample with size n the discrepancy between the sample estimate and the hypothesized population value is as large as or larger than what was observed in this sample. The p-value is the answer to this question. Let's use the body temperature data from the homework assignment in Module 3 to illustrate the calculation and interpretation of a p-value. Note that this example is also discussed by Motulski in the reading assignment for this module. Looking at the summary statistics for this data, the sample was comprised of 130 healthy adults with a mean body temperature of 98.25 degrees Fahrenheit. If you recall, this data set was derived from a data set presented in a 1992 JAMA article that provided a critical examination of the historically assumed value of 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit for normal oral body temperature for healthy adults. As such, a natural value of the mean population oral body temperature to assume for the null hypothesis is the traditional 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. We know the sample mean is 98.25 degrees Fahrenheit. 
The difference between these values is 0 0.35 degrees Fahrenheit. Thus, the question addressed by the p-value in this situation is as follows. If the population mean truly is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit and the sample mean is 98.25 degrees Fahrenheit, what is the chance that in a random sample with 130 healthy adults, the discrepancy between the sample mean and the hypothesized population mean would be 0 0.35 degrees Fahrenheit or larger? The p-value answers this question. The calculated p-value is less than 0 0.0001. In a later module, we will discuss more about the actual calculation of this value, but for now, let's focus on the meaning and interpretation of it. This p-value tells you that if the population mean truly is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, there is less than a 0.01% chance that the mean of a random sample with n equal 130 will be as far or farther from the hypothesized mean as actually observed. Does this mean the null hypothesis is incorrect? No. It just says that if the null hypothesis of a population mean of 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit is correct, there is only a tiny chance of obtaining a random sample of data like the one we observed. A reasonable conclusion to make from this result would be that based on this sample of data, the null hypothesis isn't true, and the true mean population oral body temperature isn't 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Given the sample mean, we might conclude it's slightly lower than that. In choosing a null hypothesis, it's useful to remember that the p-value approach is structured in such a way that the p-value is measuring evidence against the value assumed under the null. Therefore, in general, the value of the null is usually selected to be the opposite of the hypothesis the researcher hopes to be true. For the temperature example, the point of the JAMA paper was to determine whether there was evidence against the historically assumed normal value. Let's introduce some statistical notation for describing the null hypothesis. Traditionally, the null is written as a capital H subscripted with a zero. This is followed by a colon and then the parameter of interest, here the population mean designated as a Greek mu, and its assumed value under the null, here 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Although we haven't explicitly mentioned it yet, if there is a null hypothesis, then it naturally follows that there would be an alternative hypothesis. For the temperature example, the natural alternative hypothesis is what we refer to as a two-sided alternative hypothesis, meaning that we are interested in deviations from the null in either direction, higher or lower. As shown here, the alternative is written as a capital H subscripted with a 1. This is followed by a colon and then the parameter of interest, the directionality of the alternative, and the value of the null. For this example, we have a not equal sign. Similarly, we could have evaluated a one-sided alternative hypothesis that indicated a specific directionality, less than 98.6 or more than 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. We will discuss more about one-sided and two-sided alternative hypotheses and how they differ later. Let's now summarize the results for both inferential approaches, a 95% confidence interval for the population mean body temperature and a p-value testing the null hypothesis of a population mean value of 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. The 95% confidence interval extends from 98.08 degrees Fahrenheit to 98.42 degrees Fahrenheit. We can make the statement that we are 95% confident that the true population mean body temperature is contained in the interval from 98.08 degrees Fahrenheit to 98.42 degrees Fahrenheit. The p-value is less than 0 0.0001.
we can make the statement that if the population mean truly is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, there is less than a 0.01% chance that the mean of a random sample with n equal 130 will be as far or further from the hypothesized mean as actually observed. Notice that the null hypothesis population mean value of 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit is not contained in the 95% confidence interval for the population mean. The values in the confidence interval represent plausible values for the population mean. We have a very small p-value suggesting that the data at hand is unlikely to occur by chance if the null is true. Thus, it does make intuitive sense that the null value of 98.6 would not be included in the confidence interval. We will talk more about this in the next section where we will introduce a formalized inferential approach for interpreting p-values known as hypothesis testing and discuss the duality between hypothesis tests and confidence intervals. As is always the case with statistics, there are assumptions to consider. We have already discussed the assumptions underlying the confidence interval for a population mean. What about p-values involving population means? As it turns out, the assumptions for p-values are the same as those for confidence intervals. Let's review them. The sample is random or at least representative of the population under study. The subjects in the sample are selected from the same population and each subject has been selected for inclusion in the sample independently from any other subject in the sample. The sample data being analyzed is accurate. The final assumption is critical and relates to the underlying Gaussian distribution assumption. If you will recall from our confidence interval discussion, the T star value used in the margin of error formula for the confidence interval requires a Gaussian distribution assumption to be valid. We will discover in a later module that the calculation of a p-value involving population means also involves the use of a T star value. As before, the assumption can be met if the underlying population is Gaussian. Even if the underlying population distribution is not Gaussian, we know from the central limit theorem that the sampling distribution of the sample mean is Gaussian, provided that the sample size is sufficiently large. As mentioned before, it's difficult to make general rules about what is large. In some circumstances, as few as 30 observations may be sufficient to apply the central limit theorem. However, only a real understanding of one's data and discipline-specific experience can enable an educated guess of how large is sufficiently large. We will continue our discussion of p-values in the next section.